So back to the domestic terrorism situation. Uh, has that gone any further? Was it just a storm? No, it's not just a storm. In fact, uh, in this last budget, while the government cut, in, cut support uh, for many important uh, projects, renewable energy, they cut support for, I mean, they, they're cutting Environmental Canada. They laid off 300 scientists. They're cutting, you know, many important research stations in this country that not only we depend upon to research the impacts of toxics on lakes or, or, or pollution in our atmosphere, but mm -hmm. many people around the world depend on Canada's research stations. So they cut that, and then they put money, extra money, into the CRA, the Canadian Revenue Agency. And that money is explicitly to start to hound and look at environmental groups, and to specifically look at environmental charities and whether charities are following the right laws. And don't get me wrong, I'm not opposed mm -hmm. to the laws, but the fact is, they haven't found any infractions. There's no reason for this witch hunt. And what's happening right now is many important environmental groups, instead of um, researching the legislation that's being proposed and the impacts that the government is having, they're busy answering questions from the CRA because they're going through these lengthy audits. I, I went through one myself because several of the projects that I ran were projects of Tides Canada. And I had CRA auditors saying to me, so in 2008, you had a meeting on this day. Please provide the minutes and the outcomes of that meeting. And I have mm -hmm. eight meetings a day, you know. So. Right, right. And so you're not saying the government shouldn't do due diligence. You're saying if there was an eco-terrorist who, who blew up a building or destroyed a pipeline, they should go to jail. Fine. Sure. Okay, but if you are working to save the environment and fight climate change, that's not something that should put you in jail. Yeah, they're, they're running after and attacking environmental charities because those charities oppose the policies of this government. Because they've it's, stripped the environmental protection laws, basically. Yeah. Well, and they're creating a fear amongst people about standing up, regardless of whether where you stand on the increase mm. of super tankers on our coast or the new pipeline proposals. The fact is, the, you know, our, our, the history of Canada is that we believe in democracy. People should have a say, and they shouldn't be, they shouldn't fear being silenced. You know, at mm. a dinner party the other day, I had a friend of mine who doesn't work in environment um, say to me, well, I, I signed one of those petitions against the Enbridge pipeline. Should I be worried? Am I on some list somewhere? You know, it's this kind of McCarthy chill that anyone who's opposed mm -hmm. to what the government is doing should be worried that they're going to be attacked too. And that's not okay. And we have to go back to the basics, like where should the oil go? If indeed the oil is extracted from the tar sands, where should it go? Uh, should it go to Kitimat and through the Great Bear? No. So where else could it go? Could it go to Rupert? Uh, like if you're at home sitting at your kitchen table trying to figure out, am I in favor of Enbridge or not? What questions should we be asking? Well, I think first of all, we should be looking at what are the risks. I mean, mm -hmm. we know from the government's own studies in Alberta that this is, this isn't oil that's going through these pipelines. This is bitumen. It's one of the most corrosive substances on the planet. And that's, that's liquefied why we, bitumen, right? Yeah, and that's mm. why we've seen so many oil spills in Alberta in the last month. That's why we see, you know, the government estimates um, that there is a leakage uh, every 1.4 days in the pipelines. You know, what that means literally is since 1990, there's been almost 20,000 mm -hmm. spills. and. And, and so we need to be looking at the risks. We need to be seriously asking ourselves, do we want to have 225 oil super tankers going up and down the most treacherous coastal waters in the world that are known for hurricane winds, that are, you know, there's mm -hmm. a reason Calamity Point is called Calamity Point or Terror Point or yes. Grief Bay. You know, the, this is a very dangerous coastline. These are some of the largest oil supertankers in the world. And who's going to be left bearing the costs of that kind of spill? Uh, have you talked to BC coastal pilots and the, the men of the sea who are uh, on these ships? Yeah, and, in, and increasingly they're also not only... Um, but they're, they're also very concerned. And we're also mm -hmm. seeing, of course, the, the people who work in fisheries, people who work in tourism. I mean, that, we support about 45,000 jobs in this province in tourism and fisheries, and they're the ones that would suffer as a result of an oil spill. I'm trying to figure out where to stop it. Uh, tar sands, obviously the oil sands in Alberta, uh, oil is king in Alberta. That's not going to be stopped at this point. 
No, it, it's not going to be stopped entirely, um, but we need to slow it down. The, the rate of expansion right now is just simply not sustainable. We're polluting at a rate of about 300 million liters of toxic sludge being poured into open pits every day. We know that those pits are leaking into the Athabasca River. We know that we're seeing rare cancers in Alberta. We have some of the highest air pollution in the world. We have acid rain again in mm -hmm. Alberta and Saskatchewan, you know, which is one of the things that we actually solved, mm -hmm. you know, in the 80s and 90s. So it's too fast. We need to slow down the expansion of the oil sands. And new infrastructure like the pipeline, the Enbridge pipeline or the Kinder Morgan proposal, which would go right through Vancouver, you know, those new pipelines only make sense if we're planning to dramatically expand the tar sands. So Enbridge's own analysis shows that the if that pipeline goes through and if the significant expansion then to feed that pipeline goes through, it would be the equivalent of, um, of putting three million cars, an additional three million cars on the road. So I'm not saying that we don't need to use oil. Of course we need to use mm -hmm. oil, but we need to figure out how to use less and less of it. And we need to quickly move to producing renewable energy and electrifying our transport, high-speed rail, electric cars. That's what we're seeing other countries doing. And Canada's being left behind. And the result is a, a toxic legacy that our kids will have to deal with. Well, that's really the most explosive environmental debate since uh, clear-cut logging. Uh, going back to the tar sands, the link to water, because water and energy are so related. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't drink oil down the road, so we're going to have to drink water. So what's the deal there? You know, they say to extract, uh, I've heard this, I don't know if yep. it's true, but to take the oil out, it takes so much water. Enormous and amounts all of water. That. Mm -hmm. And, and um, a huge amount of that water becomes toxic sludge that we don't actually know what to do with. I mean, you, it's, it, when you read the company's materials, it's really astonishing. You know, they're, they're saying, well, we, you know, we're, we're recycling the water, we're, um, we're reclaiming the land. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, it's another great Quinn story. I came back from the UN climate negotiations in South Africa this year, and I'd been gone for a couple of weeks, and I was sitting at dinner with my son, and he said to me, Mommy, there's good news since you've been gone. I said, well, what's the good news? And he said, well, they fixed the oil sands. I said, what do you mean, Quinn? They fixed the mm -hmm. oil sands. And he said, well, I saw it on TV. They just pat it back in place, and all the birds mm -hmm. and trees have come back. You know, mm -hmm. this is the result of a multi-million dollar ad campaign that, the, that, that Big Oil is funding to yes, convince us. Yes, and ongoing, us. ongoing to help us understand Project Enbridge at, at that level. Have you been able to talk to anybody at the top in Enbridge? Because I know you're good at this because you certainly did it in the Mac Blow days with Linda Cody and you are certainly not an environmentalist who won't talk to uh, boards and uh, presidents of mining companies. You're not, the point is about you. You're not against mining, and you're not against logging, you're just against not doing it right. That's true, um, and I certainly have talked to people in government and people in many of the oil companies. I haven't yet talked to anyone in the uh, pipeline companies, um, but I think that we need to understand that there is a core difference between the logging debates and the agreements we were able to reach and, um, and these dirty oil debates, which is the fact that we're living in the climate era. You know, we're living mm -hmm. at a time when even conservative bodies like the International Energy Agency are ringing alarm bells and saying it's time now to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, to keep it in the ground because we're reaching a dangerous tipping point where we'll see a dramatic increase in violent storms, et cetera, et cetera. So in the climate era, can you really have green oil sands? Is there really a mm -hmm. compromise to be made with pipeline companies? I don't think there is. But think Asia wants our oil and that's money. Well, that's true, but money for whom? <laughs> you know, right now, the dramatic expansion of the oil sands and the inflated dollar, as Mulcair has pointed out many times, is affecting other parts of Canada's economy. The oil sands are the most capital-intensive sector in Canada. If we put the same amount of money and the same amount of intensity into any other sector, we would have more jobs and more economic revenue. It's not the only thing we know how to do in this country. Uh, it's true. Jeff Rubin uh, was here, a former chief economist, CIBC. He wrote, Your World's uh, About to Get a Whole Great Lot book. Small, Smaller, his new book, End of Growth. And he's an insider who had an aha moment about where we're really going. Yeah. Less is more is his big That's message. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Pora Berman, uh, this crazy 
Time is uh, her book. It's now in paperback, and we'll come back and talk more.